So we thought we'd do this evening as a kind of conversation backwards and forwards. Um, we, the last time we played together um, was at a mutual friend of ours in Paris. You opened and we did a kind of double bill. So we thought we'd do it more democratically this time. <laughs> Um, we that authoritarian approach. Yeah, exactly, because the, the arm wrestle was a draw. We couldn't decide who to start, who would start. So we thought we'd go, and you get to play first. Well, thank you very much. Because you're the better dressed of both of us. And That's very <laughs> <sorry. laughs> Let's see what's happening here. Ooh. That reminds me of a joke. Uh, bass player runs to his <laughs> manager. It, no, it's, it is good. Um, bass player <laughs> runs to his manager backstage and he says, the guitar has detuned one of my strings on my bass. I'm not going on. And uh, the manager's like, well, why don't you just tune it again? And he's like, well, he won't tell me which one it was. <laughs> That's really terrible. I know. <laughs> this is Between Streets. <laughs> Thank you. 
you're a better guitar maker than you are a sound engineer. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little bit, maybe you can just drop the volume a little bit. I think, just a tiny bit. Yeah. Now you're a brilliant sound engineer as well. Now there's two pieces. Uh, they um, they kind of got together when I wasn't looking and <laughs> became a, a thing. And so far the relationship has been going quite well. Uh, the first piece is a very old. Um, not that of course in a relationship age is a problem. But <laughs> the first piece is a slightly aged uh, piece from uh, the Manding Empire in West Africa. Uh, it's called Tasirima. Um, it's an old piece, uh, probably can be maybe a hundred years old, could be more, you know, these things evolve slowly through many players uh, playing collectively. It comes from the griot tradition, which are the, um, the hereditary musicians from Mali who, who have kind of um, allowed me in their, in their ranks in, in, in a few ways um, uh, through the, the translation that I've been doing onto guitar and I'll tell you more about that as we progress. And the second piece is about a, a, a s small, short uh, love affair I had with a folk singer. Um, we used to uh, spend some time together, uh, mostly in the car. She was a wonderful singer, so um, our relationship mostly comprised of her singing to me. Um, she's quite well known, um, so you should check out her music. Her name's Joni Mitchell. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <and> <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, 
it didn't work out. I think I think because of the, the age gap and <laughs> and now when I do go to the, um, to Canada to play, um, she very rarely answers my calls, which <laughs> I feel is a bit, a bit hurtful. But um, so I, I wrote this song um, for her. It doesn't sound at all like her music. Um, in fact, it has absolutely nothing nothing to do with her music or her at all. Um, <laughs> but I think the original link came because I, I made I started writing this in a, a hotel room in um, in a ta- in a town called Ar- Arlborg, which I always very s- I struggle to say. It's in, in Norway. Uh, it's in Norway. Denmark. It's in Denmark. Thank you. You've been there. <laughs> it's not a great town. And there, I was in a I was in a I was in a hotel room which was a lot, about as big as this magic carpet here, mm-hmm. and and I was I was playing the song and I I was looking out onto this big grey parking lot with this big grey sky and I was thinking about Joni Mitchell's line, you know, they paved paradise and and put up a parking lot and anyway I, I called a taxi and it arrived and it, it wasn't yellow. But <laughs> um, but when the door opened the radio was playing that song. Mm-hmm. Swear to God, you don't believe me, but it, it's true. <laughs> and so that's how the journey connection came and it, it reminded me of those beautiful drives we used to make before my CD player was stolen in, in Musenberg. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
This piece is uh, inspired by the bridge in Venice, Rialto. Has anybody visited Venice? Seen it? It's very nice. It really is. When I first went to Venice, it was raining. Yeah. And I really thought I was so lucky to be there because it was definitely not going to be there the next year. Well, exactly. You know, so <laughs> they, 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 they got these pumps and they're pumping water out of basements and everything oh, yeah. looks like it's rotting and then you come I went again four months later and it was sunny and it was all fine and it just carried on it's amazing thing. life goes on there yeah no, not for long I don't think you can't <laughs> last <laughs> they brought the Dutch in now and that's a bad sign you know they're trying to get yeah they're building dikes and stuff because of all those big ships you know? oh I did see one of those while I was there yeah yeah anyway. I, I can't comment I can't possibly comment on whether the arrival of the Dutch is a good idea or not. Sorry, I've, I've, no idea. But I've, I've ruined the rom romance of your Venice story. So, <laughs> so start well, again. Put it this way, next time I go, I'm not inviting you. Okay. <laughs> uh, come on, it could be Paris. All over <laughs> I went for a walk at about half past four in the morning and enjoyed the mist over the canal and this beautiful... Bridge. It was actually the second time I'd been to Venice. The first time they were rebuilding it, so they had one of these pictures of the bridge <laughs> and a building site behind it, which wasn't the same. in all my life <laughs> and the thing is with Venice is you can't just call a cab you, you're no, no, stuck no, no, in, I actually had to take all my clothes out and pour <laughs> litres it's feeding back a little bit uh, and pour litres of water out of out of my jacket well, that was just in the airport wasn't it <laughs> that was well that was it where I was staying and, the, the, and the, the terrible thing was I was I think I was there for a night and I'd left all my clothing somewhere else so I didn't 
and I'm sure you would never make this mistake. I, you, uh, I, you know what? I didn't take I a change did of clothing that. at all, so, and I had to get to a gig in uh, about 45 minutes. And, and they had a dryer, but it was in Italian. <laughs> That's and, confusing. And I didn't have a smartphone then. And I was phoning friends and, you know, trying to get, and I couldn't work out how to use this dryer, so I spent an hour ironing all my clothes and went, went to the gig a bit, a bit wet, basically. It's, it's not good, is it? I, I had a bit of a clothing trauma on the way over. They lost my baggage in Amsterdam. And I had to wait 24 hours for a, for a change of clothes. And that was fairly <laughs> traumatic. <laughs> Thank you. I feel your pain. Um, this is a piece by the great guitarist Ali Farkature. He's a guitarist from the north of Mali. Town, uh, he, he, Ali died 10 years ago. He played in Cape Town about two or three years before he died. Um, and it, it, he did a gig in the, in, in the wonderful Cape Townian tradition, um, which is what we, we often do here. We invite incredible musicians uh, to come and play in the city and then we tell nobody. <laughs> <laughs> so as a huge, huge fan of his music, I was, of course, the last to know. And um, I found out that he was playing about halfway through his first song. And I was living in Cape Point at that time, which was an hour from, from the waterfront. But I, I managed to get there in about 15 or 16 minutes. <laughs> and and I um, arrived, and, and there he was playing, and this great legend uh, of Malian music. And he had a, he had a session guitarist like, I, I, who I assumed was a, a French guitarist playing with him. And I was listening to this guy, and I was thinking, Oh, this is really different, you know. Like, I wonder why he, he chose this guitarist. It's it's kind of interesting, and and the gig went on, and I kept thinking, wow, this is like this is strange but cool in a way. And at the end, they announced that the guitarist was Albert Frost, who they'd who they'd got to to wow. play with him. So that was interesting because um, I had never seen Albert um, play before, so I didn't know it was him. I just thought that. Um, Ali had kind of got this kind of, you know, rocking out guitarist <laughs> in his band. And uh, anyway, his, his son was playing Calabash, uh, who's now a very famous guitarist in his own right. Ali, Ali tried to stop him playing guitar and sent him to the army, um, which, you know, I, I'm definitely going to do with my children. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and anyway, unfortunately, that didn't work. And yeah, his, his son is now... Uh, an equally famous guitarist. I often find myself at, in, at the same festivals as him, and he, he actually came to Cape Town. So I never got to meet Ali um, face to face. Uh, you know, at, at that gig, I didn't I didn't go and say hi, which I kind of regret now. Um, but I did uh, go with a large group of Malian musicians, Tumani Diabate and uh, Sheikh Tian Sek, and like all the the greats of of that region, and we did a. A ceremony to mark uh, the 10th anniversary. He's passing in the middle of the main street in Bamako where they have a large statue uh, to Ali dressed in a long bubu and his very cool Stetson hat that he often wore and his guitar and he's in the middle of the thing and we all went there and crowded around and we put flowers there and and I, uh, I happened just by chance to have my guitar with me. And uh, Afel Bakum was there, who is the head of the Ali Farkature band now. He was, he was the second guitarist then, and now he's taken over the band. So I called him over, and I, I, I played this song that I'm going to play for you now to him. And, uh, and he said something afterwards, which I've never entirely really been able to translate 100% the meaning of, because it can kind of go both ways. Uh, he said, uh, he pointed his finger at me when I finished playing and he said, that's a very difficult piece to play. <laughs> <laughs> chance to play it to uh, Vio, um, Ali's son, in uh, backstage. We were both playing at um, City Hall here for a World Music Festival, and we had a jam um, backstage, and I played this piece for him, and he was really blown away because he can't play this piece, which is kind of cool. <laughs> so he asked me to show him how to play it. So I was found myself in this situation backstage with the son of one of the greatest guitarists of Africa teaching him to play his father's piece. And, and then he showed me the rhythm of how the calabash would be played. 
and uh, and where the um, you know where the accents are because uh, the wonderful thing about Malian music is if you ever find yourself listening to it and then if you tap your foot, you know that that's exactly where you're not supposed to be tapping your foot. <laughs> <laughs> they do this kind of really interesting thing. So I um, he was he was tapping the rhythm on the back of my guitar over here and so I actually if ever I forget the rhythm I can always look at my guitar because it has these very beautiful Vio Farcature nail indentations <laughs> all, the, all the way around that's the first that's beat helpful. and then the second it is it's, it's really helpful and I didn't want to be like you know I didn't want to be a wanker about it and say you know this is actually a very expensive guitar and like and, you know but anyway so but I bring it here and we can maybe sort it out <laughs> So I was about to go on stage, and then he, he played it. His he played another piece which we were playing, and he tuned my E string really high, my bass E string. And I I knew from experience that you can't do that to a classical guitar because when I started playing this <laughs> Northern Malian music and I was using this tuning, I would break strings all the time. Like every you know two days, the string would break. So I said to him, eh, you know that string. He says, No, no, it's fine. <laughs> I had to go on stage in about five minutes, you know, and I was just imagining having to go on with like a five string guitar, but it worked out in the end. So the piece is called 56, and it commemorates the independence of Guinea, which was one of the first African countries to gain independence.
has turned into a bit of a magic carpet right this has <laughs> Where are we going next? A440. I'm A440, yeah. <laughs> you can go wherever you like. Do you do A440 or do you like do 436? Are you one of those hippies? No, I'm not one of those hippies. No, not at all. Okay, that's reassuring. Contrary to popular belief. <laughs> <laughs> There's this thing going around about the about the fact that the, the cosmos is resonating slightly lower. It's the music lower, of the spheres, isn't it? Yeah, the, slightly lower than the... Banging on about. And it's such a problematic <laughs> thing. We won't go into it, but uh, anyway, if any of you subscribe to that. <laughs> Embarrassingly enough, for this, this record here, mm. um, I got someone wrote to me and, and said that... Um, did you know, did you purposely tune that to for what is it, four thirty six? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, and they were so excited because they thought that you know <laughs> I had tuned to the resonance of the spheres. But actually, what had happened was I have a little tuning fork that I use because I don't right. use this electric stuff because I'm that kind of hippie. That's right. And and my <laughs> tuning fork, um, I put it in my guitar case um, where I keep my super glue, which is where I <laughs> where I fix my nails. And and a little bit of the super glue had gone onto the tuning fork, which actually made it go lower in pitch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's so my tuning fork was a, the, resonating at the, in the cosmic vibrations without me <laughs> without me realizing. So this wow. this album is actually is actually not only um, is not only uh, this is this is the commercial part of it. You can buy these afterwards. Um, <laughs> they're, they're not only is it resonating at, in the harmon in harmony with the spheres, it also has an orchestra of crickets playing alongside me, which I discovered after. He recorded and then listened to it. And say, That's helpful. Those are frequencies, yeah. My first album has um, an anti mosquito frequency running through it. Really? Yeah. On purpose? Yeah, deliberately. I hate mosquitoes. I used to, well, I'll tell you why in a second, but yeah, I put an anti mosquito frequency running through it. And it's still there on the MP3 as well. Does it work? Um, so far, but that's only in London. <laughs> can I can I tell a story just because you said that's only in London? Please do. Because yeah. it's your fault. You put me on the stage with you. I mean, you could have played separately. <laughs> so, this is exactly why. He says it's only in London. So Tumani Diabate is the chorus player whose music I translated into first and and fell really in love with. And and um, one of the big kind of breakthroughs for me in in being able to play in countries other than this as much as I do like this place. Um, it's not the best place to be a guitarist. Well, look, I'll, I'll play here if you don't want to. You can play? Yeah, yeah you can do it. Um, I'll give you all three contacts. For yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Finally. For the three contacts. Just don't tell them I sent you because they probably don't speak to me anymore. Um, so, I, I, long story short, I, I sent a, a, a copy of this record actually to a guitarist called John Williams, who's a kind of up-and-coming mm. classical guitarist <laughs> from Australia. A young guy, yeah. Young guy, yeah. yeah. He's, 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 he's not yet 80 and he's only recorded about 136 albums. Talented. And over the last few years, um, that's even if you don't um, include the... Uh, Sky. albums he did with Sky which we don't like to talk about really? I yeah he still it. thinks it's cool and I was like John no it is it's not it's cool it's amazing no, no. <laughs> Kevin Peake's electric guitar solos are absolutely godlike anyway so that's British thing that I'm not going to ever get yet <laughs> Uh, so I sent this album to him, and the long story short, we ended up playing together in, in, in London, and and we did a, a, a triple bill with a, a jazz guitarist called John Etheridge, oh, okay. who'd made an album with John, so it was a three guitarist, the two Johns and me, and John Etheridge said to me, oh, you know, in 1989, I went on tour with Stefan Grappelli, the wonderful Ooh. jazz violinist, because he used to be his, uh, his violinist, and he said that um, their opening act was Tumani Diabate, the chorus player, and he went to and this is where the link to Not in London comes in. So just so you know, I'm not going on like a self-promoting tangent. Look, it's a magic club. <laughs> we can go wherever we want this evening. Don't so we? he said, um, he said, uh, Tumani, this is John Etheridge, very mm. funny guy. He said, Tumani, I want to know, what is this thing about magic in Africa? So Tumani said, you know, because Tumani is like, a, like a, you know, an ace uh, bullshitter. Really. Uh, he said, no, but John, it's true. And he said, no, but Tumani, not really. I mean, I've heard that a man can turn into a lion. He said, yes, John, it's true. I've seen it. He says, no, come on, Tumani. <laughs> not actually. I mean, a man can't actually turn into a lion. 
Tumani looks at him and goes, I see what you mean, John. Not in England. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go somewhere where I had pretty much my, my worst mosquito experiences. <laughs> I wasn't here. From uh, 2002 to 2008, I was in Greece, the country, not the musical. Oh, uh, should, uh, How many times have you used that? <laughs> that's the first time. <laughs> literally the first time. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first time I've played that. And Greek music is on a completely different level, just like Greek culture, Greek poetry, Greek cooking, Greek mosquitoes. And this is uh, a piece of Greek music. It's very popular with uh, surf guitarists, belly dancers. And um, lovers of the work of Quentin Tarantino. It's called Mizzaloo.
Cheeky bit of Jim Morrison in as well, obviously. Was it nine eight or three four in triplets? Oh, don't do that to me. Was it Thalas? I came, I came, I came, I Thalas. I came, I came, I came. Yeah, it, technically it's nine eight, but it depends. Um, uh, how I'm feeling. Yeah. I'm actually part Greek. Are you really? Yeah. Which bit? <laughs> <laughs> but you can't see. <laughs>
<laughs> this is a piece called Stars Over Bridgetown, and it was, um, it was commissioned by a friend of mine for his son's wedding. And I accepted the commission with some trepidation. The last time I'd written music for a wedding, um, I'd been asked to, to write two little pieces of music, about two minutes long. Um, one for when the bride went down the aisle, and the second for when the uh, bride and groom were, were signing the registry book. Seemed simple enough. The first bit went without a hitch. Um, no pun intended. No pun intended. <laughs> you guys are slow. <laughs> <laughs> the second bit, however, as they were sitting down to sign their names, which should have been fairly simple, they found a spelling mistake in the groom's middle name. So what was supposed to be a two-minute piece turned into a 25-minute improvisation <laughs> as, they, uh, as they sorted that mess out. So I said yes to this. On the understanding that I couldn't be responsible for clerical errors. <laughs> the groom had proposed to his beloved on the uh, beach. An oldie but a goodie, absolutely, it's, it's effective. It worked this time. Uh, and what I did, in, I, I was looking for inspiration for this, and I asked their parents for all the information they could send, you know, their nicknames, what they like to do, their hobbies, and all this sort of stuff. And that helped, but one morning I woke up and I thought, you know what, I'll have a look and see what the position of the stars was on that evening when, when he proposed. And so I went on this map of the, uh, of the sky over Bridgetown that night and I printed it off and I laid it over a piece of manuscript paper.
I think Derek and I have decided that we're each going to play one more. So this is my way of saying goodnight. Thank you for joining us this evening. You've been a wonderful audience. You've been spectacularly attractive. <laughs> you really have. This, this is a piece I haven't played for quite some time, or hadn't played for quite some time until yesterday. I ran a guitar workshop here for interested individuals, people who collect guitars, people who buy guitars, play guitars, sniff guitars, the whole gamut of interest. And um, in demonstrating a certain technique, I reminded, a, uh, I reminded, I remembered a piece that I used to play. It's dedicated to my father, the original Michael Watts, and uh, it's called Wide Stride Man. Um, before we go, I'd like to say thank you to Matthias Rue and Matthew Rice of Cassimi Guitars. Um, I don't know how much you know about this workshop, but you are truly in the presence of greatness here. Uh, these guys build some of the finest instruments in the world, and this guitar that I have had the privilege of uh, squeezing all evening. Um, it was just the first one they ever made. It doesn't even have their logo on. This is the seed of what was to become 
uh, an incredible company and they are, they're very talented guitar builders and truly sumptuous human beings and uh, <laughs> it's been a pleasure to, to spend time with them and indeed with you this evening. This is me saying good night and this is Wide Stride Man. <laughs> Shouty bits. It's fine. And the zip. And the zip quote. <laughs> and the zip quote. And all the rest. I should have just warned you. Alright, well, it's been good. And I'll see you in London. We're yes, gonna, you will. We're going to do... We're not doing a... We're, we're not playing. doing a thing. Basically, um, Derek is coming out to London. And I will be hosting a question and answer session. Are you bringing questions or are you bringing answers? Both. Both. Okay. It's good to know in advance. <laughs> right, I'm going to play you some, a little bit of Bach to end the evening just so that you can all leave um, feeling. I don't know how you feel after Bach. Um, <laughs> I've never played, I haven't actually played this to people before. It's kind of an intricate piece, and I was doing a, an experiment to see if, um, if I could teach my, f my fingers to play something without getting um, my brain involved at all, which has been a, a, an interesting, it's a trust <laughs> thing. You know. um, it's kind of how I mostly work, but always I cheat a bit with Bach, and I start memorizing it a little bit with my brain, so I've been very strict with myself 
this time and looked out the window and pretended not to notice and then let that happening happen. <laughs> Which means that the risk is much higher, of course, but we're all friends here, so you know, we'll see how far I go. It's a, it's a, it's a piece in, it's a piece in, uh, from f originally for solo violin. I've tuned two of the strings a semitone down just to make it slightly harder. So the, the notes aren't in the right place. And uh, I hope you enjoy it, and thank you very much. And um, do you have any CDs for sale? Uh, I don't have hard copies of my music, but there is an album called Vetiver, and it's available on iTunes and Spotify, Tidal, Deezer, Amazon, Play, Google, Earth. Yes. Skype. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's everywhere, basically. You can, you can get a better than CD quality copy from my own website. It does have that anti-mosquito frequency. Yes. That's the one. Well, all I have is the Cricket album, which is, a, is <laughs> which is an older an older record of mine, and it's been out of print except on vinyl for quite a number of years. I forgot to bring the, the vinyl uh, copies with me, so if any of you are vinyl people, let me know. We, we live close to each other, so that's fine. These are very special um, because it's been out of print on CD because I stopped making CDs, uh, kind of, and... Anyway, I found these in my mother's garage. <laughs> and I was really, it was really great because I actually got a call from someone who'd ordered one because I'd forgotten to put out a print on my, on my website. Mm -hmm. And they'd ordered one and then I, I got this email and I was like, oh, what am I going to do? And I was sitting there thinking, all right, how can I get a copy? And then as I did that, my mother called me, amazing mothers. And she said, I found a big box of these CDs in my, in my garage. You know, and I was, that's amazing, literally at that same moment. So get them while they're hot. <laughs> And that's that. Thank mm -hmm. you. 